at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in East Hampton, Connecticut. High school kids have just gotten out of school. They're not prepared to go home. They want to go to a local hangout area known as Engel Falls. Oh, I can't believe it's only Monday. something in the water they don't recognize. As they get down further and closer to it, they realize it's the body of a woman face down in the water with her hands tied behind her back. Not exactly what you expect to see on your way home from school. I spent my career closing murder cases, but I'm not the only one who answered the call. It takes a rare breed to solve the unsolvable, to catch a ruthless killer, to find justice for the dead. That's what it takes to be an American detective. I was the investigative sergeant with the East Hampton Police Department. I was on a day off. I was actually dropping my three children off at the swim practice. I was paged to the police department. Yes, Kelly. I was informed that I needed to come into work because there was a victim found in a remote area in East Hampton. My reaction at that time involved a lot of questions, of course. East Hampton was a sleepy bedroom community. This is a small town. They haven't had a homicide for 10 years, but he gets the call that they have one now. I was always looking to, to get involved in the big one. I really had no idea what was to come. arrived, Sergeant Romano was there, as well as patrol officers who had secured the scene. The location where the body was found is a very remote area. There's a stream running through with a waterfall up above it. It was one of those roads that, that if you weren't from the area, you wouldn't know this was there. What do we got? A couple of kids throwing rocks from the bridge. Officer Martin Swan meets with Kelly and explains what is known so far. Body's still in the water. I looked down over the bridge and saw a woman's body laying face down in the stream and obviously motionless and deceased it was almost surreal it was a scene that you would see out of maybe an alfred hitchcock movie or something we summoned the state police major crime squad for evidence processing and crime scene technicians were responsible for securing and recovering any evidence at the scene had found some duct tape that had bound the woman's hands. Drag marks leading from the pavement down to the site where the body has been discovered and tire tracks leaving the area. It is obvious that this is a dump site for this body and not a crime scene. So they have no way of knowing where this crime took place. They only know where it ended, which is in three feet of water in this river. So the medical examiner arrives on the scene and moves the body, pulls her from the water, and turns her over. As soon as the body was turned over, I identified and recognized the woman as, as Gertrude Ochakowski. People call her Trudy. She's 60 years old. She's born and raised in East Hampton and has lived in this small town all of her life. She's reported missing this morning. On the car parked in town. 
Officer Martin Swan informs Kelly that at 7.40 that morning, he was called to a laundromat in town. Regarding a vehicle running, containing a frantic little dog, he discovers that car has been there all night. They did a registration check and found out that the car uh, came back registered to Trudy Ochakowski. He gains entry into the car. Finds the victim credit cards. No one has been in this person. He goes into the laundromat and finds wet clothing and a washing machine. Most likely belonging to this victim. Where is she? She would never do that. She would never leave her dog, especially for that extended time. You know, something's wrong. And now all these officers are standing on a shoreline looking at the result of what that wrong was. I don't think I can tell you much until we conduct an autopsy. There is no apparent gunshot wounds. There are no stab wounds that they can see in this body. However, the body's been submerged in very cold water, which has a tendency to close openings in the skin. They're only looking at what they can see. Method of death to be determined. If you find anything more, let me know. We had to, at that point, tell Trudy's daughters that their mother had been murdered. I knew both of the daughters from town, and that was a very uh, emotional and, and, and personal thing to be involved in. I just don't understand why anyone would do this to her. I, I couldn't believe it, and especially the way they found her, just the way she was, the way she was treated. It was awful, awful. Trudy's daughter reports her mother is a loving woman who's everyone's friend. She's just a sweet, lovely person. Trudy is just a wonderful, warm, loving person and she would give you the most amazing hugs that you could possibly imagine it was just your whole world was safe when trudy hugged you she was employed as a home health aide uh, and worked for a home health care agency trudy was a caregiver she always wanted to do something for someone else and always put herself aside for anyone else you don't find people like that you just don't who could possibly do this to her kelly is charged with finding out who that might be She's been seeing a guy named Ray, Ray Brown. She said they had gone out on a, a date or two, so that was somebody that we needed to obviously interview at that point and try to determine what, if any, involvement uh, he had. So Raymond Brown, as advertised, comes in and speaks to Kelly. How long have you and Trudy been seeing each other? She sees him as a friend and a friend only. Well, Mr. Brown, you may not see it this way, but as a homicide detective, I see you as a potential suspect. So Kelly asked him where he was. Well, I was, uh, I was away for a few days. He says he was at a bowling tournament, not only with lots of witnesses, but with several policemen from Kelly's own department. He was ruled out as a suspect by a strong alibi. No bad vibes at all from Ray. So Mr. Brown is out. He's not a suspect. He's just a friend of the victim. Did anybody tell you guys about the guy who was spying on Trudy? Interesting. Very interesting. Someone of interest, finally.
So now Kelly knows about the peeping Tom thing. These occurrences made her uncomfortable, and she didn't want to continue to live there and was looking for another apartment. I was hoping I could ask you some questions about Trudy. They go back to this building where Trudy lives, and they talk to everybody in the building. Did you by chance ever hear anything about someone spying on her or looking through her windows or anything like that? None of the residents in that building have any knowledge of a peeping Tom looking in any window until they run across a woman who says, well, I know exactly what you're talking about. You do? Yes. That was my son, Eddie, but it was all just a big misunderstanding. She, of course, denied that he would have any involvement or responsibility in doing anything harmful to Trudy. When she says Eddie's a good boy, her son was going to be the vote but lost in the final election process. They're not impressed with the fact that Mother says he couldn't do this. Would it be possible for us to speak with Eddie? Sure can. Just go down to the jail where you people locked him up. That guy was identified as a local petty criminal, and he happened to be locked up in jail doing a sentence for a uh, small-time crime. So there was no way that he could have been involved. The next day, the medical examiner did an autopsy on the body, part of that crime. Could there be hair follicles or, you know, maybe scrapings under the nails if there was some type of altercation or struggle that went on? But it was discovered that there was no biological evidence that would indicate any sort of identification of a offender. But the cause of death was determined to be manual strangulation. There were some signs of trauma in certain areas that would be associated with uh, sexual assault in addition to some bruising indicative of violence to the head and face. So it was a pretty brutal death for, for Trudy. Let's take a look at her eyes. There is a blue contact lens in the left eye. There is no contact lens in the right eye, so that's missing. Is that how you see that? He finds the backing to a gold earring in her ear, but only the backing. So the earring is missing, which would indicate there's probably another earring missing as well. At least it gives us something to look for. Kelly knows if he can find the missing earring and or the missing colored contact lens, it will lead him to his crime scene. Thank you very much. If you find anything else, let me know. Who could do this? Who could do such a horrific thing? You always have that question of why? Why would you do something to someone that was so beautiful? Why would you do that? It's a crime that definitely shocked the conscience of the community and made it from this sleepy little bedroom town into now a situation where there was a murderer on the loose. There's an old cliche that people in small towns always offer up when there's a violent crime. Things like that don't happen here. Unfortunately, things like that do happen in small towns. There are good people who lead their normal lives, but there are also monsters. And once in a while, they show themselves. This type of did not and does not happen in East Hampton. It was just the one that rocked it to his court. Everybody had a tidbit of information, so the tip line, you know, the flow of information from people that wanted to help was just astronomical. So Kelly's going through these lists of anonymous tips, and he runs across one that strikes him. A woman reports that she's taking her niece to the bus stop early in the morning of the and she goes past the bridge over the river where the body was discovered. She sees a car parked on the bridge. The car was described as a boxy style, blue or greenish sedan vehicle. It was very out of the ordinary for a car to be parked there. So why is it parked there? Well, maybe it's parked there because the occupant is dumping a body into the river from this car. Kelly makes a note that maybe, just maybe, something like that car is the one used. So Kelly does what homicide detectives do. We discovered the long time acquaintance of Trudy. They were in uh, on again, off again uh, relationship for years and we definitely wanted to talk to him. It was something that definitely needed to be drilled down upon intensely. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me, Mr. Jameson. We asked him about their relationship, what the status of it was at the time. 
He explained that he had not spoken with or seen Trudy for about three weeks prior to the murder. I was wondering if you recalled where you were the night of the 11th. The ex-boyfriend told us a very troubling account of what he did. Well, actually, I was over by the laundromat. You were? Yeah. He goes on to say the night of the 11th, he's out for a bit, and he drives by the laundromat, and he sees Trudy and it's running in front of the place. Well, yeah, um, we kind of left things on a bad note a few weeks back, and I wanted to set things right, so I waited on her. He waited in a parking lot next door, and he never saw her come out to the car. He walked around for a little while, didn't find her anywhere in the laundromat or elsewhere, and then went home. So you didn't think anything was odd and didn't think to report it? I, I didn't know it. I, I just didn't think anything about it at the time. You didn't think about it. Now, that's probably one of the worst stories Kelly's ever heard. Is it that bad of a lie? Or maybe he just heralds a blockhead. He doesn't think anything about an idling car with a barking dog and a woman that can't be found in a town that small. Look, I would never hurt Trudy. I loved her. Harold is very distraught about her death. He was cooperative, and we searched his car with his consent. Didn't have any sign of any sort of uh, struggle or evidence in the car. Everything about Jameson checks out except the world's worst alibi. Kelly doesn't feel like he's the guy, but he can't eliminate him either. So Kelly and the chief of police are discussing this case. Sergeant Kelly. When a phone call is received from a witness. Okay, okay. Don't touch anything. All right, all right, I'll be right down. carpenter who was working on renovations in the building as he was cutting some wood this earring appeared he could see it glowing outside of the sawdust the word travels like wildfire through this town that this woman's been murdered and he immediately knows that this has got to have something to do with it this has got to be kelly's crime scene and he's on his way to prove it there are apartments under construction on the third floor where a carpenter has found an earring At that point, we had the major crime squad respond. They began their scene investigation, and amazingly, one of the crime scene detectives found a contact lens in that room as well. That's the missing blue-tinted contact lens from the right eye of Trudy. There's no question in anyone's mind that this is a crime scene where Trudy Ochenkowski met her death. The finding of the crime scene indicated to us that it had to be somebody with a good degree of familiarity and access and comfort with the building. The carpenter says only two people have a key to this door. Well, there's Frank, oh, the guy that owns the place. We were quickly able to rule Frank out by a solid alibi that he was not there in town in order to be able to commit the crime. The only other guy is the maintenance man, Brian Tuttle. So Frank is out. However, Brian Tuttle is someone he hasn't heard of before. We were not that familiar with Brian personally, but he was from a local family, and certainly with his employment at the building, he clearly had to be considered as uh, a suspect in this. So when Kelly returns to his station, he does a background check on Brian Tuttle. He moves from being a person of interest to being a prime suspect. Chief, you're not going to believe what I found on this Tuttle suspect. He had a prior conviction for a stranger abduction and sexual assault. And he had recently gotten out of jail. So that was a big moment in the investigation. Kelly's a homicide detective, and he knows what that means. He's been caught once. How many times has he not been caught? Kelly wants to talk to him and wants to talk to him immediately. came in willingly and he had a scratch over his nose from eyebrow to eyebrow. It's a nasty mark you got there. How'd that happen? Oh, uh, the word. Something happened, a word. So that was also very suspicious to us because it could have been something that the victim did in defense of herself. Be my, be my guest. So I was very sketchy, very nervous about the fact that we were approaching him. 
you're looking at this guy and you're like, yeah, this guy's capable. There was something there. This could be the player. You might tell me why I'm here. Brian, I uh, wanted to ask you about your prior conviction. Tunnel explained his prior conviction as a misunderstanding in which he was drunk and he encountered this woman. Things went wrong. He also explains that he did abuse drugs and alcohol together. Here you go, Trinkowski. No. I don't know. He just kind of rapidly dismissed it. His reaction was odd. It's not a big town. She lived right up the road. There had to be some passing. Uh, can you... Tell me where you were the night of the 11th. He said that his activities included working in the building during the day and then going to the pizza place across the street. And then he said he went home and went to bed. So his alibi isn't much of one, except for his time in the pizza place. He spent the rest of the evening alone. You drive a car. No, I have a German car. Tuttle claimed that he did not drive because his license was under suspension. If Tuttle is truthful and he doesn't have a car, how would he then be able to dispose of a human body? It would be very, very difficult. As the interview went on and we pressed him more, he finally decided that he did not want to participate in the interview anymore. Now, Mr. Tuttle is still a suspect in this crime. There's a lot of things about him that are really, really interesting. They are circumstantial only and don't rise to the level of keeping him under arrest. I'm gonna get somebody from evidence in here. I'm gonna keep that. We kept those cigarette butts that he had smoked and secured them as evidence for possible use in the future. It's 1998. DNA is not well known. It's not even widely used. Kelly is a very smart guy. And he is well aware of the fact that science advances, science changes. And he knows that maybe someday those cigarette butts are gonna mean something. Brian Tuttle presents himself as a prime suspect. Now it's time to look into him very carefully. So the first place to start is with the regulars in a laundromat. I was wondering if you all knew anyone by the name of Brian Tuttle. Yeah, I sure do. Which one know about him? He finds almost at once that Tuttle is lying to him. They all say that Tuttle knows Trudy. They've seen him talk to her on many occasions. We had witnesses who told us that he'd had a prior conversation with her right in the area of the apartment building. Again, you come back to it's a small town. People talk and everybody knows everybody's business. Trudy was interested in relocating from the apartment building that she lived in and had a conversation with Tuttle about that. And Tuttle declined that he even knew who the victim was. Anytime you interview somebody, you're looking for the first lie. Because if you lie to me, I'm talking to the right person. So by Tuttle's own words, he had gone to the pizza place across from the laundromat in the evening of that day and had a few beers about what interaction they had with Mr. Tuttle that evening. How's it going, John? Hey, Detective, how's it going? We interviewed the brother and sister who owned the pizza place, John and Anthony Manalakis. I did know the maintenance guy, Brian. He came across as actually a really nice guy. He would come in quite frequently. Was he here the night of the 11th? Oh, yeah, he was here. <laughs> When I saw him, he just didn't look like his normal self. <laughs> the biggest thing I remember were his eyes. Um, they were just so red, so glossy. They described him as being depressed and definitely under the influence. Hey, you uh, doing okay, Brian? Seem a little upset. My girlfriend, man. Apparently, the woman that he was with, I guess he caught her with another man. He said he could not handle that. And he got really, really upset and had this argument with her. It was very ugly. And he started drinking, and he's been drinking all day. So my sister came out, and she sat down with him. And apparently, he was asking her to go to this local bowling alley down the street there. Come on, you come just a little while, right? No, I don't think I can. Um, we're about to close up shop, so I need to tell my brother out. It was a very uncomfortable scene. I knew there was definitely something on. So Kelly is now aware that Tuttle has told him two major lies. The first lie is that he doesn't know Trudy Ocean 
Bukowski. The second lie is that he has given up the drugs and alcohol and is a changed person. I think Mr. Tuttle has some explaining to do. So now Kelly brings Tuttle back in for a second interview to confront him about these problems with his statements. We know you knew Trudy. We've got people that saw you converse with her. Oh, no. We confronted Tuttle with his many, many lies. At that point, he, he still claimed that uh, he did not know Trudy. Tuttle says, I don't know her. I never did know her. But he does admit to having fallen off the wagon. And it's because he's so distraught over his cheating ex-girlfriend being with another man. What's your girlfriend's name? Denise. Denise what? Tuttle was emotional and, and distraught and was putting on a whole scene. Like, he couldn't believe that he was being blamed for this. I'm done with all this. I'm going home. He was just kind of dismissive of everything. And at that point, we still didn't have sufficient physical evidence. I'm Kelly talks to him. Now, the most important thing that happens in this second interview is that he's able to obtain the name of his girlfriend. This is, according to Tuttle, cheating ex-girlfriend that has driven him to drink and drugs. That's significant. So we went out and interviewed the girlfriend. She told a completely different story to us about their breakup. I don't even know where to begin with that man. He's out of control. Her story was that Tuttle had been drinking and using drugs again recently, that they were in an argument about that, and she basically threw him out of her place. So Kelly now is quite clear that Tuttle is lying completely about the difference in his relationship with this woman. In addition, at the very end of her statement, she says, plus there's another thing. The girlfriend told us that when she threw Tuttle out of her place, he took her car. That car happened to be a Volvo sedan. It was a boxy style sedan that was blue and greenish in color. Really? Kelly thinks back to that witness. That sees a bluish green boxy car on the bridge where Trudy's body was found. That was important. That was a very strong piece of the investigation at that point. Another nail in Mr. Tuttle's coffin. He thanks Denise for her words. He has more things to do. Now Kelly is faced with the fact that he has to find this car. And remarkably, the car finds him. A guy named Jeremy Hartley calls the police station, claiming to be the cousin of one Brian Tuttle. I do, Mr. Hartley. I hear you have something that might interest me. Sure do. Jeremy explains that he has a blue-green Volvo parked in his yard. The cousin reported that Tuttle had asked him to take the car to a remote area of town and to park it in a very specific spot. Hartley tells Kelly he just had a bad feeling and he decided to bring the car to the police. It's another big gotcha moment in, in the case because we suspect that this car was used in the transportation of, of the deceased. So we then seized that car. We are hoping to find some biological and trace evidence in that car that would link the victim to the car. Kelly calls in the CSI tech team. They go over the car very carefully. And they find what they believe is a body fluid system. Waiting for the results from the forensic lab is a long and painstaking process. It's frustrating. They have to do things very meticulously, and it takes time. And finally, after weeks of waiting, the results come in from the state laboratory. Sergeant Kelly. Kelly is informed that the samples from the car match the victim in this offense. So it ties Ochenkowski to the specific car as a method of transportation of her remains. But there's no evidence to support the presence of a second person, meaning a suspect. The state police laboratory claimed that they were unable to get any DNA readings or what they call amplification. We were hoping for 
that's connecting Tunnel and Trudy in a biological sense, and we didn't get that. We can say the Tunnel had access to the car, but we did not have any type of evidence that Tunnel was in that car. So now Kelly is left with a case where he is convinced that Brian Tuttle is a rapist and a murderer, but he's unable to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt in a courtroom. We got one shot. If the jury throws it out and says not guilty, we can't come back at him. All circumstances pointed to him. There just wasn't enough to get an arrest and a conviction. So Kelly does what all homicide detectives do. He waits. It is agonizing. It is horrible, but it is often necessary. Patience is a requirement. Kelly has it because he needs it. Kelly wants to prosecute Tuttle and knows he cannot. They have to wait for some other method to tie Mr. Tuttle to this crime unequivocally. The frustration of living with the case is very heavy to have to deal with day in and day out. It's even more difficult in a small town when everyone sees you as a stumbling block between justice and the death of a beloved member of the community. You see these people at church, you see them in a grocery store, you see them all the time, and you see the look they give you, the look of blame, the look of guilt. It was difficult to face the daughters. There was a lot of things that I could not tell them because it had to be kept confidential. It was very frustrating not to get those answers. Why would somebody have done that? How could you? How could you do something like that? We knew the scuttlebutt going around town. We were the small town cops. We didn't know what we were doing. We screwed up. You know, Sergeant Kelly's, you know, testament, he, he didn't quit. We were just piling up all the evidence that we could. But the more time that passed, yeah, it became a, a strong reality. And I was still absent uh, some linking pieces to bring this whole thing together and get a conviction. So the matter goes cold. It stays cold until the year 2013. This case came down to the science. Technology had advanced in a rapid way, and the lab was able to identify DNA in this biological material that was in the car. They're able to draw semen from the body stains, which they then apply to the cigarette butts that Kelly was so clever to keep when he first talked to Tuttle, and finds a direct match to Brian Tuttle. There were strong matches from the cigarette butts to Tuttle's contribution to the DNA in the car. We had them at this point. The numbers were so astronomically through the ceiling that we, we had them. So the arrest warrant signed, and now we have to locate Tuttle. And to Sergeant Kelly's diligence, he knew that Tuttle was residing in South Carolina. So a team of investigators from the state's attorney's cold case unit went down and arrested him in South Carolina and transported him up here to Connecticut. They attempt an interview. Tuttle, of course, declines. He won't say a word. But the likelihood is great that the crime occurred in the following month. He walked out of that pizza restaurant drunk, high, after being turned down and rejected. He's angry, he's upset, and he sees Ochenkowski, someone he knows. One must keep in mind that sexual assault is not a crime of sexual gratification. It's a crime of the punishment of women. Mr. Tuttle is currently hating women. He is angry and he needs to hurt someone. And he selects Ochenkowski. Hey, Trudy. Hey, Brian. Hey, did you want to check out the empty apartment upstairs I was telling you about? Um, I've got the dog in the car. Oh, it'll only take a minute. Okay, I'll take a peek real quick. Yeah, come on. So, lured her up into this apartment building. Trudy went with him innocently enough, you know, she didn't feel threatened by him. She had no idea she was placing herself in that type of danger. Once they got up into the apartment... When are they going to be finished with this place? He attacked her brutally. <laughs> she was 
bound by duct tape, carried her down the stairs, and put her in the back seat of the Volvo. Drove her down there to the stream in the early hours of the morning. And dragged her out. And threw her to the stream. He goes on about his business. And for 16 years, he gets away with it. Until the evidence catches up to him. Brian Tuttle was formally charged with murder and presented um, before a judge at Spirit Court, Middletown. I was shocked at his appearance. He was morbidly obese, in a wheelchair, with oxygen connected to him, very immobile. That's what happens. You know, karma comes back. It does. The case went through its prosecution phase, and then finally in 2016, Tuttle decided to plead guilty. He's sentenced to the rest of his life in prison, and probably because of his physical condition, isn't going to last that long in prison. But that's where he goes. He's not going to get out alive, no doubt. I'm glad he's finally paying the price for what he did. Brian did an awful lot of damage that night to a lot of people. Trudy, to her family, to the town. It's, it's just a good thing that it's finally done took one of the most beautiful people out of this world that was loved and that was so kind to people and so caring. She's truly missed. Trudy is truly, truly missed. We heard that we were the small town of the police department that, that we couldn't investigate anything. But we knew we could do the case. I personally have no regrets as to how long this took. I have a lot of frustration uh, and I also have a lot of satisfaction. If I had not resolved this case to this day, I still would be working on it to resolve it. Justice is provided. And Mr. Tuttle is now in a six by nine foot concrete room for the rest of his days. How many ever days those are?